Thanks for joining SIBO Digital TV, where we cover all things related to digital assets. I'm John Palmer, president of SIBO Digital, and I'm joined here today with Nicola White, CEO of B2C2. Nicola, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, John. Great. So, Nicola, if you could walk through kind of what your role is at B2C2, and then also where does B2C2 fall within the, the crypto ecosystem? Sure. So, B2C2 is we, one of the original liquidity providers in the space. We're a true principal at risk liquidity provider, which really means that we're putting our capital to work on every side of the trade. So unlike others in the industry that are maybe matching buyers and sellers, um, when you trade with us, you're taking the other side of the trade, and then we're hedging it either through you know, finding another side of the trade, maybe you know, we're taking it and hedging it with a different instrument, but we're really putting our capital at work to create liquidity, which during periods of volatility is very helpful because that's when liquidity dries up. In terms of the products that we offer, we trade everything from spot crypto to crypto derivatives. Um, I'm sure we'll touch on the derivative side of thing throughout this conversation, but really the full suite of products, which allows us to uh, service everybody from the crypto native side of things to the traditional side of things. And maybe one more point, uh, probably because it's relatively uh, relevant in, in light of current market conditions, uh, we were apply a robust risk framework on top of that. So um, we have a CRO, he has 22 years of experience, and we're really thoughtful about the risk that we take. Uh, we don't want to take unnecessary risk and, and put you know, the industry or anybody else at risk. Fantastic, thank you for that. And I think 100%, we definitely want to dive into derivatives, maybe talk a little bit about risk. But first, if you want to cover what type of demand are you seeing across your customers and specifically in the different asset classes that you cover? Yeah, so in terms of demand, you know, it's interesting. The traditional finance space, we thought was, you know, the knee-jerk reaction was going to be to pull back from crypto after FTX and Genesis, but actually we've seen them really lean in. So out of all of our traditional finance clients that we're talking to, not one of them said, you know, I'm delaying plans, I'm pushing them back. They all said, actually, I want to dive in, I want to understand more. I want to figure out if there's additional infrastructure we can bring into the space. So we're having a lot of conversations around custody, around DVP, MPC atomic swaps. So how do we add more safety and security into the space and give people um, more comfort with the asset that they're trading? And then on the, um, I guess what I would call the more crypto native side of things, after those events, we definitely saw a pullback in yield enhancement products. But we've even started to see that return over the last couple of weeks. I think everybody paused. They took a step back. They looked at their risk framework. They looked at, you know, borrowing unsecured, probably not the safest uh, trading decision. So they've gone back, they've revamped their risk frameworks, and they've come back in recently asking for more yield enhancement products, you know, structured stru slightly differently. Um, we never offered unsecured loans, so that was, that was really good for us. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, people, the bar is raising in terms of what the industry is expecting, and I think that that's a good thing. Oh, it's great. And, and you touched a little bit about um, yield, and there's obviously a lot of different ways you can generate or access yield. One of those ways is through derivatives. Are you seeing a shift or a difference in demand in kind of spot or underlying crypto assets versus the derivatives, or do you think it's in line? Um, kind of explain what you're seeing from your customers and from what you're seeing on your desk. I think it depends on, on the customer and what they're looking to do. So People that sat on large portfolios of crypto are definitely using derivatives more to hedge their portfolio. So they still might have the same long-term outlook. Maybe they want to hold those products, but they're going to put an underlying downside hedge on against that. Uh, and so, you know, I think that is ultimately good for the ecosystem. You don't want to see customers that all of a sudden on a 30% down are sitting on, you know, treasury holdings of 30% less. Uh, you want them to hedge that. On the traditional finance side, you know, definitely cash products. It's a way for them to get exposure into the space, to dip their toes in and not have to worry about some of the complexities on the blockchain side of things. So, you know, cash settled options, NDF, CFDs, if you're not in the US. Um, but yeah, all of those products I think are kind of coming and becoming more popular um, as, as, you know, those traditional finance clients come on. Great, and I think you touch a little bit about um, the differences in TradFi and crypto native, and clearly probably differences in US-based firms versus overseas firms. So maybe elaborate a little bit on, on what differences you're seeing in, in, in that kind of demand or, or that kind of positioning. Yeah, look, I think uh, it's interesting because in the US, I really truly feel that everybody wants some clarity. 
Um, you know, everybody wants to stay on the right side of regulation, or typically most, all the counterparties we're talking to are looking to stay on the right side of regulation, but they just want that path. What does that look like? And so the demand in the US, if anything, is stronger than ever, but that demand is probably hampered a little bit by the fact that there isn't that transparency right now. Um, and so what you're seeing is people set off, up offshore um, entities, offices to essentially you know, until they get that clarity in the U.S. And so, um, you know, for us, it's great to partner with people like SIBO, who, you know, there is a path to regulation. Um, we want to do it on the right side of regulation, and we want to make sure that, you know, we're really building the ecosystem in the U.S. No, that's great. And, and obviously, you mentioned partnering with SIBO. You know, we announced uh, maybe six months ago or so our our equity partnership program and, and appreciate B2C2's perspective there. And and so when you're thinking about regulation, you're thinking about your counterparty risk, how are you positioning the firm um, from a global perspective in terms of your footprint and digital assets? Yeah, so definitely, I would say we want, uh, we want to make sure that we have global reach, but we want to do it in a way where we're not, you know, I don't, not to use the word taking advantage, but taking advantage of regulatory arbitrage, right? We want to partner with our U.S. clients in the U.S. We want to partner with our, you know, uh, Cayman Island companies in the Cayman Islands, our European clients in, in Europe. Uh, and so definitely thinking about all the jurisdictions and all of the different complexities there. But for us, you know, it is, it's really important that we are working to a space that is really scalable long term. And I think the only way to do that is to make sure that you're supporting regulation locally. No, that's great. And, and one of the interesting aspects of the, the crypto market structure, the ecosystem, is this global nature. And so when I think about my background and my history in U.S. financial products, you know, that, that, that ecosystem is U.S.-based regulation. Everyone globally flies in and, and brings their capital to the U.S. because they want those liquid, those robust markets. Crypto is much different in this global nature. So how do you see regulation impacting that global footprint? And, and what should regulators or what should firms be thinking of um, as they want to grow their footprint in that, in that kind of um, differences in the regulatory perspectives across the globe? Yeah, you're right. Look, I think the the concentration or the, the distribution globally looks much different between crypto and traditional finance right now. Um, I think what that means for us is that we really need to work to educate people and partner with them to make sure they understand the nuances of the product, to make sure that the knee-jerk reaction to some of last year's events isn't, well, we're going to take traditional finance uh, you know, thoughts and processes and regulation and force it down the throat of crypto. And so what we really want to do is make regulation fit for purpose, uh, make sure that you know, we are still able to innovate within this space. And at the same time, you know, people, customers, counterparts, institutions still feel like their assets are safe, they're secure, and they have that liquidity that you talk about. So uh, fondly from the US market side of things in traditional finance. No, that's great. And, and you touched earlier upon risk. So I wanted to circle back and talk about risk a little bit. And, and obviously risk is all depends on the type of trading you're doing or the position in, in, the, uh, in the ecosystem you have. B2C2's position obviously is, is global and, and um, vast in that sense. So when you think about risk, you think about risk in spot assets or you think about risk in derivative assets and then you, you think about it in the U.S. versus you're thinking about it offshore, you know, what's, what's next? What, do you, what, what are you focused on internally on your risk? What are your customers that you're interacting with thinking about in risk? What's, what's top of mind there? Yeah, so I guess I would split risk into a couple of different categories. So probably top of mind for everybody right now is exchange risk, right? Some of the exchanges that historically crypto has been traded on, haven't necess there hasn't been the visibility necessarily that you would demand from a typical exchange. So making sure that we have visibility into where we're trading, making sure that it's backed by regulation, and making sure that our assets are uh, segregated and truly remain our assets, which um, might seem like a novel concept, but maybe in light of recent events is not, um, are all things that we're looking at. And we want to support venues that uh, essentially tick all of those boxes. And then from our risk perspective, look, we, we want to be really transparent with our customer base. We want to make sure that they know the type of risk we're taking. Um, they want to make sure that we, they think we're being responsible about it. And so we're spending a lot of time diving in with clients, talking about how we think about risk, which for them is an education process as well. 
um, we learn something from the conversation, they learn something from the conversation. It's an iterative process. And I think it's ultimately really great and positive for the industry. You know, you, you made a great point there. And I think a lot of folks get tied up in thinking crypto and crypto assets, this new thing, and we have to relearn everything, but the, the same risk management practices, controls, processes, procedures, you know, checking the box and all the, the pieces that you talked about are not new to global financial products. And, and there's a lot of players like B2C2 um, that are already doing that and taking those mindsets. So that, I think that's a really fantastic point. Um, we talked a little bit about TradFi versus crypto native. There's this this thing called the FI is right now growing, I think, because crypto created it maybe, but TradFi, CFI, DeFi, whatever you want to call them. What's your perspective on those and, and how are they going to merge? Are they going to, um, are they going to uh, move in separate directions? And how does B2C2 think about it? Yeah, so on, let's maybe separate TradFi a little bit outside of DeFi and CFI. From a TradFi perspective, like I said before, the interest is there. People are moving into the space. It's how do they get into the space? So cash products first, get comfortable with blockchain, move into uh, you know spot products probably after that. But then there's this other application that I think we haven't even scratched the surface on yet, which is you know, how do we streamline and innovate traditional finance markets? So people talk about tokenization, how to use uh, blockchain for settlement. And I think that that's really why the demand is there. Like, the technology itself is, is so interesting for the traditional finance application. On the CFI and DeFi space, look, DeFi had a rough year last year. I think that would be, to put it mildly, there were hacks. Um, you know, people don't truly understand it. And I think, you know, we need to spend some time. We need to educate ourselves. DeFi needs to have a space in which to incubate itself. So, you know, from our point of view, the biggest problem we need to solve in the DeFi space is KYC and AML, right? How do we support KYC and AML in this distributed space? There are lots of people that are working on this problem. And so, you know, how do we incubate those projects and make sure that, you know, we can, we can support them, that they have the ability to grow and the space to grow. And then when they're fit for purpose to come into the space, you know, we're, we're integrating them in. Uh, and then that'll also allow us at the same time to spend some more time on security. Clearly Bridges had a tough year last year. Um, but that's really about education, making sure people know what's going on, and then um, making sure that there's enough eyes on it to, to make the project secure. On the CFI space, you know, uh, I might, if some of the crypto native people might not love me saying this, but I do think custody comes into the space temporarily. You know, everybody talks about, oh, well, can we do smart contracts? Can we do something like that instead of doing uh, true traditional finance custody? I, I think ultimately, yes, we can do that. But at this point in time, what's truly known to people that hold the wallets globally is the custody solution, right? So it's something they're familiar with. They know how to adopt quickly. Um, and if we really, truly want the crypto space to grow in the short term, I think it's important that we support those type of projects and people feel like their assets are safe. Oh, that's fantastic. There's a, there's a lot there. And, and, and I think a lot... What's, what's great in crypto is there's a lot going on, right? As you mentioned, it doesn't matter whether you're TradFi or you're a CFI believer or disbeliever, or you're a, a DeFi believer, which typically tends to be maybe those <laughs> that don't believe in CFI. There, there's something for you. There's building happening, and, and there's a lot going on. So that, that's fantastic. It's never a dull day. That's right. <laughs> well, it's it's been a pleasure having you on today. So thank you very much for joining us. But what's next for B2C2? What's what's on your near and short-term roadmap? And, and then what's long-term? How are you thinking about the future? Yeah, so short term, definitely want to uh, help fill the liquidity gap that we feel has been created over the last couple of months. Um, we have a ton of clients uh, moving through our pipeline, trying to get onboarded with us. So uh, first and foremost, it's, you know, how do we solve the short term needs for the industry? Uh, and then I think medium term, it's, you know, ge geographic reach. So getting into some of those areas that we're not currently um, in and also product reach, right? So um, NDFs are a big topic of conversation in the U.S. How do we support those? Uh, you know, derivatives, would, lo like, would love to see a U.S. derivatives exchange right now. The only exposure you can get on exchange to derivatives is off, uh, offshore. That's not to say that that is necessarily, you know, in rounding out the ecosystem, you need, you need some regulated and some unregulated offerings, and we just want to see that space grow uh, pretty fast given the demand in the next year or so. 
Oh, great. Well, hopefully there'll be some uh, some places that offer <laughs> some derivatives um, in the near Maybe. term. Shameless <laughs> plug for SIBO Digital, but super excited about that. And, and again, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to have you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Thank <laughs> you.